Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to tonight's Henry Moore Institute research event. I'm Claire Nadal, Programme Coordinator at the Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's Material Poetries event with Simone Fatal and Maggie O'Sullivan. This is our latest event in our current Sculpture and Poetry research season, which runs until the end of February, and it's the third of our four intellectual artistic blind dates. Each of these events brings together a renowned artist and poet to discuss the overlaps between their practices. Tonight, we welcome artist Simone Fatal and poet Maggie O'Sullivan for a live conversation on the role of materials and languages. We have developed the Sculpture and Poetry Research season in collaboration with Nick Thurston, Associate Professor of Fine Art at the University of Leeds. Nick co-founded the Artist Writing and Publications Research Centre at the University of Leeds and is a fellow of the Leeds Poetry Centre. He is the author of two experimental books, Reading the Remove Literature, published in 2006, and Of the Subcontract, published in 2013. He writes regularly for the Lit Literary and Art Press, as well as for independent and academic publications. His most recent book is the co-edited collection Post-Digital Cultures of the Far Right, um, published in 2018. Nick will be chairing tonight's In Conversation event, and I'll be handing over to him shortly to introduce tonight's speakers. Our other partner in the research season is Corridor 8, who are a not-for-profit platform for contemporary visual arts and writing in the north of England. Corridor 8 have developed a new sculpture poetry microsite which acts as an archive and repository for the research season, hosting recordings alongside further resources and interviews. We'll be posting a link to the microsite in the chat shortly. Corridor 8 have also commissioned four new pieces of writing in response to each of these of our four um, in conversation events. The first written commission um, by Callan Waldron Hall, made in response to our bodily poetry events, um, which was held last November with Heather Phillips. Heather Phillipson and Raymond Antrobus is now available to read online on the Sculpture and Poetry microsite. Further writings will be made available in due course. And you can also find links to introductory material for both of tonight's speakers, Simone Fatal and Maggie O'Sullivan on the microsite. As of today, we've now announced our programme for our forthcoming Sculpture and Poetry Conference, which is the final event in the research season and will take place on the 23rd and the 24th of February. Um, the conference includes keynote talks from artist Olaf Nikolai and art collective Slavs and Tatters, and the programme can be found on the Henry Moore Institute website. Um, a, link to, a link to the programme will also be coming up in the chat very shortly. Please do check out the programme and I hope you um, might be able to join us for the conference. And now, without further ado, I'm really delighted to hand over to Nick to um, introduce our wonderful guests for this evening. Thanks, Claire. It's lovely to be back. Um, as Claire mentioned, there will be some web links in the chat area to the project microsite and to the pre-event material shared by this evening's two guests. So please do return to those anytime. And there are also further reference resources about all of the guests throughout the season on the microsite. So you can do as much or as little kind of follow-up research as you like. <clears throat> there are things to watch, there are things to listen to, to read, and they're all tagged accordingly. So. Now we get to this evening's event, Material Poetries. I'm joined by Maggie O'Sullivan from her home in Hebden Bridge and by Simone Fatal from her apartment in Paris. There are formal biographies for both Maggie and Simone on the website, but I just want to quickly and very subjectively explain why I've invited them both to this conversation under this evening's theme. Maggie's work as a, a poet and sometimes sculptor has been relentlessly experimental for decades. It features all the hallmarks we might associate with Anglo-American avant-garde of her generation, like radical disjunction, fragmentary form, experimental typography. But unlike most others, she uses them to listen to and to sing about wilder things, everyday experiences of nature written in ways that resist the pastoral, everyday experiences of ancestry, of ghosts, and echoes that resist simple confession or autobiography. You can listen to her read the opening extract from her new work in progress, This Earth Brought Into, on the Project Microsite anytime. 
Now, Simone's um, many lives as a painter, philosopher, influential editor and publisher have taken her on a long journey to sculpture or working sculpturally with clay. Her work seems to explore major and minor themes, often at the same time. It features eternal hero characters like the warrior or poet or lion, but loosely figures them in semi-abstract forms and does so at a kind of less than heroic small scale. So the sense of a journey seems to run through her approach to making art in the haptic marks left in the material and more generally in her outlook on life. So Maggie and Simone, thanks so much for joining us this evening. Now, in a sense, we have uh, three key themes that frame this evening's conversation. We've got sculpture, poetry, and materiality. I'm particularly interested in how they overlap in your respective practices, but I wonder if we could start by thinking about your relationships with each of those three things as a way of getting going. And I wonder if we could start with sculpture. So, to get us going, could we take it in turns to talk about your formative experiences of sculpture? And maybe Simone, could I ask you to respond first? Good evening, Nick and Maggie and everybody listening to us. Thank you for asking me. Uh, I have to say that uh, in my formative years, sculpture has, has had no or practically no uh, presence or no influence. Painting was also absent when I was growing up in Damascus. My, our house had no really uh, paintings, some, but the most, uh, <coughs> the real uh, work of art which surrounded us everywhere in the apartment were carpets, oriental carpets, Persian, Turkish, the house was full of them. The walls, the sofas, the canapes, the chairs, everything was covered. So it was, the beauty was there, the extraordinary um, aesthetic experience was all the time. Um, and we also had uh, visited a lot all the archeological sites in Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, wherever. And I must say, it's not the sculptures that I saw there, which were the most important, but the architecture. And the architecture is overwhelming. It's present, it's, uh, it's all over in Egypt. And the sculpture comes as an accompaniment. It's something that comes after, it's, you see it after. I must say that one great aesthetic experience was in the Aleppo Museum. There, there's a fantastic Sumerian sculpture called the goddess with a, um, with a flowing water. And this is such a beautiful masterpiece that I can say that this particular work had a huge influence on me. And I tried to do it many, many times, of course, <laughs> far from being, far from being anywhere as beautiful. So I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah. it's something to start. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, thanks, Simone. And uh, Maggie, can I ask you the same thing about your formative experiences of sculpture? I don't think I had one. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, now, we, <laughs> um, however, um, I was brought up as a Roman Catholic, um, and I had the aesthetic experience of going to mass regularly, um, and all the uh, very co colourful um, uh, kind of uh, uh, ritualistic uh, saying of the mass. Um, it was very performative. Um, and the inside of the uh, of the church, uh, the architecture, that's about it, really. Um, and we, I, I never went to exhibitions or uh, saw any paintings or or um, works of sculpture. 
Simone, am I right in saying you were you you were went to school in a convent school? Is that right? Yes, yes. Yeah. I, I, I attended mass as much as Maggie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe much more because when I was in boarding school, we had mass uh, four days a week. I, I, on top of the Sunday, so I mean it was really intense, but uh, no, the ritual didn't. The statues didn't speak to me. The ritual uh -huh. didn't speak to me. I adored mass. Yes, in the school was Latin, French, uh, French schools which used the Latin uh, way of performing the mass, but the G Greek. Mass and the Syriac Mass were extraordinary visuals that I loved. Mm. And it was especially the music, mm. the singing. But Maggie, you, you went, I mean, it's like the original art started in the churches. <laughs> well, who knows? <laughs> but I, I loved the Latin. It, in, in those days, the Mass was said in Latin. Yes. I loved the sound of the Latin language um, and the pageantry of it. Um, mm. You know, it's very theatrical, I think, now looking back and uh, very colourful. Um, and the, the, you know, the different vestments that the priest used to wear for different, uh, you know, different celebratory days. I mean, that's, that's, that's about, you know, it's, it's been there in my life, but it's not particularly sculptural. I wonder if there's, it sounds like the sound and the song the of language mm -hmm. were a really important part of that. And I, and I think I'm right in saying, Maggie, that your father was a singer as well, yes. though of a very different tradition, yes. like an Irish folk tradition. Is that yes. right? Yes. Mm. And so were those two, two big influences on your falling in love with the sound of language? Uh, well, my, fa my father, I think, has a lot to do with it. Mm. Uh, he was always singing and he, he, uh, he was born in West Cork and they have a particularly beautiful uh, a way with language that is full of movement and heights and depths. Mm. Uh, Simone, can I, can I cheat here for you as well? Because I, I remember you telling me a story about escaping the convent and going to London. <laughs> well, could you take us there? I didn't really escape because I had finished my schooling and I had okay. passed my baccalaureate, but my parents wanted me to learn English and they had a friend uh, who had an apartment in London and uh, they wanted to take advantage of me spending a year with this lady instead of sending me later to something or somewhere they didn't know. So that's why I was sent very early. I was 17. And I spent the, the whole school year, 59, 60. And that's where I discovered art, really. Actually, the year before, I had gone with my parents to the, there was a, a um, universal exhibition in Brussels. And, you know, every country had a, pavilion and there was a pavilion for modern art that's where I saw painting okay. and it was a huge discovery I still have the, the catalog annotated and everything I saw Franz Marc I saw Picasso I saw absolutely everything it was a discovery so when I went the next year to London I spent all my time at the National Gallery, at the Tate, and so on. And it is in those years that I discovered Henry Moore, because it, he was the big star of the, that moment. And I adored his work. I really did. Yeah. And he was the first like, modern mm -hmm. uh, 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 sculptor that I got to know. Yeah. This sounds like terrible product placement, <laughs> but, but you, the, the, the love for Henry Moore is genuine and, well, and, and it's lasted by the sounds of it. It's lasted, yes. Yeah. Um, now, when I went to all these, uh, I especially sh saw paintings, I was discovering paintings. Uh, I didn't look for sculpture 
particularly. But if I went, of course, to the British Museum, so that's why actually sculpture and archaeology are linked in my mind. It's also very close to how Henry Wu works. I mean, he works, mm -hmm. he has pre-Columbian statues in his mind, Greek statues in his mind, and he's very much linked to the history of sculpture. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it was the same for me. Um, Maggie, while we're in London, I know London was a formative place for you as well, uh, for, for many years and in, for many reasons. Um, do you think you could take us there now we've now we've left childhood <laughs> um well i went to london at 19. um i had uh, uh no experience of art really except i used to go to the uh, local arts art school um i just used to go for saturday workshops um so there must have been something going on and i'd always written and drawn um, all my life and um, uh, well after a lot of um, unsatisfactory experiences I discovered Bob Cobbing's workshop which to me was absolutely um, uh, a life transforming experience he's had a huge influence on me and that workshop because I, I'd never been to university um, uh, I didn't have a lot of education and uh, he was very open and receptive to me and I felt uh, what I was doing was okay, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I just loved his uh, complete op openness and his embracing many, many forms of visual and verbal language. Um, I discovered uh, Jerry Rothenberg's anthologies and his work as well at the around that time. And then Language Magazine, all these things, you know, the American language poets um, I fell in love with. And I just felt this, this was such a very exciting time for me, mm. um, you know. And am I right in saying that what you were, you know, making then expanded and changed as well, because as well as writing, you, you started to make physical work as well. Yes, I did very large assemblages of uh, found materials, um, all sorts of things. I used to collect stuff, um, uh, particularly fabrics. And um, I've always been interested in discarded things, um, you know, the cast offs, the unwanted, um, and putting them together. There might be, a, um, you know, a, 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 an image or two that you could put yeah. up. But, but I have used them on the front of my books. Um, yeah. yeah, this one I did uh, 1986, I think, of military domains, that was one of them. Um, and I just collected these pieces of material and these medals and these, uh, I collected a lot of uh, dolls um, and broke them all up and painted them with red gloss paint and put them in that little box with rope around them. Um, mm. And then these little chili things I got from the greengrocers, um, just stuff I found. And, 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 and <clears throat> falling into this kind of work was an ongoing part of the very instinctive way in which you had already begun to work. Is that, is that right to say? Yes, I just did them. Um, yeah. I don't know where they get. Well, I, you know, I, I went, when I, I, I met my partner, Tony in London, he was a painter. And so we, um, we used to go to um, all the great shows very regularly. Um, I, I owe such a lot to him for really introducing me to, to you know, to wonderful painting. Um, I, saw, I saw fantastic shows and we used to go to the theater, poetry readings. So I was open to a lot, a lot of different input, you know. Um, and I did these big, big assemblages then. I was you know, young, I had a lot of energy. Um, so the, the, the size of them didn't phase me, um, you know. Yeah. Simone, you, you mentioned there uh, a, a particular connection that you felt from the off between archeology span and sculpture. Uh, could we return to that and, and, and stretch it a little bit? Because it's something that seems from the outside 
like a very apparent aspect of your current work as well. Uh, the, the, the current work in clay, which I wonder, Claire, if you could um, jump slides to as well to give us some indicative sense of. Um, but Simone, could you take us back to that? These two works have nothing to add. Uh, well, there we are. You have here on the screen a ziggurat on the right hand side. And this is a sculpture as, archae as archaeology, as architecture, as I was telling. Yeah. I mean, the ziggurat is a, a Mesopotamian temple, Sumerian temple. Usually it went way higher than three stories, but uh, this is what I could do thinking about it. I kind of reconstructed it. Mm -hmm. um, now, with the same, on the same sc uh, screen, you have on the other pedestal, a series of uh, um, uh, clouds, and which are exactly the contrary of the little ziggurat. And the clouds are the most recent one. So I can, as you said in your introduction, I can do something very, uh, you know, day to day, something uh, that accompanies everybody in his day, in his work, in his life, and also thinking of the old monuments or old warriors and uh, archetypes. Can I, can I ask a question that might seem really maybe even stupid, but but what is the pull to clay in particular? It's such a specific material, a thing from the earth uh, with just extraordinary characteristics. Uh, what, what pulled you to that in particular as, as one of the key mediums you work with? Well, you know, I started with uh, a friend who was a, a sculptor who did bronze. So actually the first thing he gave me were uh, wax, and I did little waxes, which I still have. I never uh, had them uh, fired, but uh, it, it kind of, uh, I don't know. Uh, I didn't really like it so much. Mm -hmm. As for the clay, it's so, the, 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 first of all, when you are working with wax, you are working through a device through an instrument, because it has to be very hot. Whereas when you work with clay, you work with your hands. And this completely intensive interaction between your body and the clay, this is what I like. And it's malleable, it's alive, it also resists you, you can't do anything you want, you just have to work with it. And it talks to you, <laughs> you know, when something is alive, it talks to you. So uh, to me, clay was um, what I really loved. Uh, and I love, I love it through all the actual transformations that he has. So right. it has to be drying, then it has to go to the kiln, then it has to be glaze and go back to the kiln. So you, it has to be fired twice. It's like you're going through a purification transformation, mm -hmm. transubstation, yeah. and when it's finally it comes out of the uh, kiln, it's still very fragile. It's still, it can die any minute, like you and me, you know, it's <laughs> not something that we survive. We have tons of great art in clay, which is 3,000 years old, but it gives you this idea of fragility, of life, of, uh, well, this is what I like about it. Have, have, have you always worked on, in, in, in lots of different media simultaneously? Have you painted as well as made clay? Do you do it at the same time or do you have to sort of compartmentalize what you're doing? Well, first of all, I painted for 10 years. Then I went to America. By America, I, started my publishing house. Mm. So I stopped painting altogether. And then when I started, went back to school to start my sculpture, I did only sculpture. 
I, I mean, I was going on with my my publisher because uh, this was this is what I had to do. But the sculpture was on a bit on the back burner. It was something I was doing for myself. <coughs> Whereas what you do for other people takes the whole the whole time. The whole. Um, and I worked like for a long time before I even imagined showing the work. I, I thought I didn't have enough. And then I had quite a lot. Um, and then when I, now I can say since I've been living in Paris, painting came back and then collages came back. They all follow each other according to the whim. For instance, if I come back from a trip, I would start with the collage because it will give me, put me back into the rhythm of working. And then I go back to the, so it's all mixed up today. I can say that. Maggie, can I ask you a similar question? Sort of going back to that, that, that um, early phase in London when you were making the assemblages. Mm. Um, I was one, uh, it got me wondering what you were writing and how you were writing at that time in your life when you were thinking through assemblage, through material and other things. Could you reflect a little on that? Well, uh, I think one of the key uh, works for me of that period was a natural history in three incomplete parts, um, which uh, has a lot of, has a lot of, um, and from the handbook of that and of Furiary, um, there was a lot of visual elements in there, um, uh, kind of interventions uh, with the visual over the text. Um, and uh, a good many of those I, I did with Bob Cobbing um, at his house uh, on his, his photocopier, basically, the very small fugitive publications. Um, and uh, I, I, I haven't really ever made a, a distinction between the visual and the verbal, making the assemblages or the constructions and working on the page. Yeah. Um, it's all been one to me, mixed or mixed together, like Simone um, has said. And I, I know this is a very crude leap, but, 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 but that's still very true of the most recent work as well, isn't it? Which interweaves typography and drawing and color. And so that's been a yes. really consistent thing. Yes, except that I don't make these big physical works now. Um, it, I'm trying to do to do it to do it in a book because uh, all my work is predominantly book works. Mm. Um, the, the book, the book, the, the book is the work. I don't. I hardly yeah. ever write one-off piece little poems. Um, it's a, it's a long um, extended work, but I'm trying to use the kind of spatial qualities um, and the textures of silence on the page um, with the language. I think it's become much more uh, minimalistic to me, um, much more pared down what I'm doing, but it's all pretty much on the page in the book now. But who knows what will happen, you know. Um, What's coming next? Mm. Well, I, the, now we've got to the, the synthesis on the page and, and Simone, you introduced your experiences and your publishing house. I wonder if we could turn to that second term, which is framing tonight, poetry. Mm. And, and can I ask you both about your formative experiences of poetry, um, maybe as a writer, but also as a reader? Mm. Um, I don't know. Uh, Simone, can I ask you first? Yes, well, reading poetry has always been a, a, a very important thing. Uh, in my in my life, and it certainly impacted my work more than actual uh, sculptures, for instance. Yeah. Uh, when I started working with clay, uh, it's poems that came to my mind, whereas they are poems by um, that modern poetry or epics, but mm -hmm. certainly the written word and in poetry was paramount in, uh, in, in, in my practice. Um, Baudelaire has been extremely important. 
although he doesn't like sculptures at all. <laughs> <laughs> he says sculpture is for notaries. <laughs> he, he would approve of your painting. <laughs> he adores paintings. And uh, voila. <laughs> and, and was that a love that was seeded very young? Was that oh, something yeah. you grew up with? I grew up with it, yes. Yeah. I grew up with it. There were a, quite a few poetry books at home. Mm. That my father adored poetry. He adored the verb, so he liked to, to he was a fantastic uh, storyteller. And he would amuse everybody. He was like, a, he would put, if we had people for dinner, he would put an act in, and make everybody laugh and cite poetry. And that was also very much in the culture. So it, it's something I really grew up with, which I adore uh, since childhood. But I never imagined writing poetry myself. No. <laughs> I became a poetry publisher. Yeah, a very important one. Thank you. <laughs> Maggie, before we move forward, can I ask you the same question about your formative experiences of poetry? Um, well, we didn't have, I never had any poetry book. There weren't any poetry books in the house. Um, but I, I, from my earliest, uh, my earliest memories, um, I used to, I used to um, love colouring in the colouring books with crayons. And I used to copy out stories from books. Um, and I used, I joined the uh, public library which uh, was absolutely intoxicating to me. I used to go every week and get as many books as I could. Um, and I've always been a reader, but everything really, not just poetry in those early, as a child. And I used to spend, uh, my family were very poor. We didn't go on holidays. So I spent a lot of the summer sitting on the grass by myself with my head in, in books. Um, <laughs> because I love them so much. Um, and um, it, it was only uh, later when I came to London and I'd, I'd always written this stuff, this, these things, you know, poems. I didn't know what they were called. I, they were just, it was just part of me. And when I came to, Lon to London, obviously I discovered a lot of poetry and John Clare was a very important early influence to me um, in many ways and is still there. Um, the thing is, you fall in love with these these um, wonderful artists and poets, and that and they're there forever. You know, they never go away. Is my experience. Yeah. You just build on them. Do do you do you still find your reading to be very rangy, beyond poetry into all literary forms? Uh, I love theatre. Theatre is a big thing. Uh, big, in, I love theatre very much. Uh, uh, I, nowadays, I don't. Uh, it's pretty much poetry, and yeah. po as reading goes. Mm. Um, but I love listening to poetry on the podcasts and stuff, you know. And um, I, I love I love film, obviously, film and paintings. Um, mm. I'm not. I don't think I'm a literate person, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> what makes you say that? Well, I'm not, literature doesn't seem I've, doesn't ever seem to to be anywhere near what I'm doing. I don't know what it is I'm doing. Um, but but the but it, but you work very instinctively, right? So so you trust that drive to this thing you don't know. I do absolutely yeah. yes. Mm. Simone, um, I want us to pick back up on this question of instinct and composition, but but partly because we've weirdly kind of got a narrative arc now. Can we, can we talk a little bit about your experiences as a publisher and particularly of the kinds of uh, poetries you were publishing, especially those in translation into English at the Post Apollo Press? I, I don't want to ask you to recount whole histories that are well written elsewhere, but <clears throat> just in, in terms of from your quite subjective point of view. What was exciting about it and what excited you about getting those poetries into the world? Well, when you, you, you publish a book, 
I mean, it's a very important thing that you are doing. It's really, uh, it's like, to me, I, the first book, it was for me, I cried and I thought, oh, why am I crying? Women bring babies to the world, they have children. But it was, it's it, so important that because this new being, which is this book, is going to have his own life. He's going to go everywhere. And uh, a book, you cannot stop a book. He will travel. And to me, superior to the work of art, the book has no support. You can know it by heart. It doesn't even have to have a little piece of paper on it. And <laughs> so, uh, it is the thing that you can carry on and that can, you can live with. And as I said, I mean, some books I published, uh, people found them in El Salvador, people found them in Canada, in everywhere, without my doing anything. Mm. About people take a book they love and will give it to someone else and give it to someone else. And it is actually the best way for a book to circulate, mm. word, of, word of mouth. Mm. I tried everything. <laughs> Publicity doesn't do it, money doesn't do it. It's the word of mouth. I totally agree, Simone. Yes. I believe in, in, the, in the power of, of a book to find its way to those who need it. Absolutely. Uh, and it defies all um, uh, kind of, uh, it defies money, and advertising and promotion. It is such such an, a wonderful act of, um, it's an act of belief and uh, an act of power to send a book out into the world. It, it is a baby, it's a birth, it's you time. know. Mm. Yes, absolutely. Mm. So I was very careful choosing the poets I was going to, to publish. Because when you have this responsibility, you really have to, to, to choose someone who is wonderful. So my first book was wonderful because <laughs> I published Etel Adna and I wanted everybody else to be a companions, mm. to be yeah. good companions to that first book. And so I chose very carefully and I also did my publishing, as you do a work of art, one book at a time with very yeah. little, uh, with taking my time. Everything was important, the typeset, the cover, the mm -hmm. color, because it all makes the reading easier and mm -hmm. pleasurable. This is what you want, because how can you read a book which is badly printed? It's terrible. Mm -hmm. And it is also a responsibility to have a beautiful thing. Big responsibility. We are, you know, you have to be respectful. Mm. And I said, the work of art is way behind because if you don't see the Venus of Milo, well, no reproduction is going to give you any idea of what it is. You have to see it. Whereas the book can be small, can be big, and as I said, it can be in your mind. So I did my publishing very carefully. Yeah. And Maggie, does that, that chimes as a similar kind of, uh, a kind of care, mm. the, uh, the kind of publishing culture that you've been, you know, yes. engaged with all your working life. Is that right? Absolutely, yes. Care. I mean, all, all my work has been published by very small independent presses. Uh, pretty much, um, uh, well, I've never had any mainstream uh, publisher uh, interested in my work, and I'm glad, really, because um, it doesn't, you know, pushing books doesn't appeal to me. Mm. I believe in the, uh, I just believe uh, that I know that um, the people I work with, my friends and colleagues who've taken such care and consideration over my books, um, that 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 care will will find its readers, um, and I think it's important for. I think it's the greatest, most wonderful um, 
gratifying um, thing to have people appreciate your work. That's all that matters to me. Mm. Mm. And value it. Um, mm. Because we need to value and respect and appreciate each other's work for it mm. to live. So the culture of care is not just in the publishing, it's also in the reception, in the community in the of reading as well. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm. Yes. Um, I wonder, could we go back to, to two things that were mentioned, uh, in part about instinct and composition, Maggie, that, that mm. came up from you, and then in part about the, the incredible fragility, but also long life that clay can have, mm. uh, Simon, something you brought up. Mm. And I wonder if we could use those as prompts to turn to that third term that's framing our night, mm. uh, materiality or material. Mm. Um, and think a little bit about some of the connections between the obsessions that seem to excite you both. And one, one thing that strikes me about both of your work is a profound interest in something like something that we could broadly call the natural or, and, and it's there in the clay you use Simone and it's there in, 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 in the animal song that you include Maggie. And I, I know it's a very um, loose prompt, but, but could we start there about the importance of the natural or nature to what you do and how you think about material? I wonder Maggie, would you mind going first? Um. Well, in my visual works or in my the language, the language work, I suppose, um, I suppose it's the transient, um, the uh, the precarious, the very precarious, the very vulnerable. Um, uh, what is what is not there or almost not there um, is crucial to me. Um, is that what you're attracted to as well? Like that's attracted what you find powerful. Yeah. Yes. And absences and silences and what, what is not overt. Um, I suppose what I, what I think I do is a, like an excavation um, of uh, languages and sounds of uh, 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 place and people, particularly uh, in the later years, uh, my Irish history is very important to me because it was oral. It absolutely depended on on a hearing and a great ability to hear. Hearing hearing as a profound aesthetic experience and imaginative experience. I think that has a lot to do with my work. Um, and, and some of that hearing, the fragile. Yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah. I think it's the fragile. Um, uh, you know, it's absolutely against all kind of um, all closure or supremacies. Yeah. And, and, and some of that attentive hearing, that listening that goes on to the natural, I mean, I'm guessing was was very important or a big change in your life when you moved to Hebden Bridge, lived on a farm, lived mm. in quite wild, more mm. like terrain. Mm. And, and, and so, so was that kind of listening to nature it just become part of everyday life, basically? Part of everyday life, yes, yeah. yes. Um, well, uh, being much more aware of the, of the sentiences that, that uh, I was amidst, um, mm. uh, uh, because I, I don't differentiate myself from other animals, I'm an animal and they are my, I aspire to be their equals actually. Um, and hearing, hearing all the beautiful songs and the sounds of, of uh, other creatures of the earth, you know, uh, living um, has been a, a very profound experience for me. Yeah. And sorry, this is my very long loop back to the thing of instinct and composition, but mm. it, there is the feeling in your work that there's no great differentiation between doing everyday things of living or getting on with life and writing like they seem to fold together is, is that a fair yes everything is all one um it's it's all folded into the fabric this weave this kind of this mesh of of you know every day um mm. Mm. and fit there's a lot of physics phys i have to do everything else the work is part of everything else 
I, I, I've never been able just to sit down every day and, and you know, write at a desk. I couldn't do that. Mm. I have to do, I have to be sorting things out and doing everything, you know. Mm. Mm. Does, Simone, does that holistic sense of the life and the work entwined chime with you? Totally. First of all, I really liked what Maggie said about everything. I mean, uh, first of all, the excavation, mm. uh, I found myself, um, when I started my sculpture, I had no idea that I was actually inhabited with all these uh, uh, archetypes and, and people that came out uh, while I was working. I mean, it's a discovery. I discovered myself what I was actually thinking about. It was not in my e everyday psyche. And so it's like going somewhere else. I mean, uh, this is one thing very important. Another thing is the listening. Yeah. We don't listen anymore. Mm, I agree. Why? Because we are inundated with noise. Mm. Everything is noise. We, you sit, you read your book and your telephone, ding, ding, ding. What is this? I mean, you don't have a moment of silence. And then you have the great Pauline Oliveras, the great uh, musician. She gave concerts and gave, put us in the experience of deep silence. For a few minutes, there was no sound whatsoever. And this is extraordinary. This is listening, you know, and this is what we should be doing so much of it. Mm -hmm. and going back to, and of course, nature has the most beautiful sounds. Mm -hmm. I mean, the sound of birds, the sound of every animal walking and coming and going. I adore animals because mm. they communicate without words, They're without even, sometimes without even sound. They do use sound, of course. You can, you see the birds, how they, you know, the conscience of the birds. <laughs> I remember once in California, there was a huge palm tree and inside the palm tree, there were thousands of birds shouting and woo. I mean, this it was amazing, the, the noise they were doing. So it's beautiful, it's beautiful. Nature is beautiful and it teaches us so much. It teaches us something that we need, that we Absolutely. have and that we need to see, to hear and experiment. No, I was just completely agreeing with you, Simone. Um, animals have, we're only beginning now to be aware of the immense intelligences and sentiences of animals. Um, and we treat them so, so uh, horribly. Um, but hopefully there's, a, you know, there is new conscious, consciousness about now that things will I have great hope for animals, but how they commune, there are so many levels um, at which they communicate that we we can't even begin, you know, they do it with in all kind, every part of their body, um, their movements. Um, it's incredible. Yeah. That was all I wanted to say. Totally, totally. They have a body language that is absolutely marvelous to mm. Absolutely. Mm. Oh. I wonder, Simone, um, you, you know, you, you talked earlier about clay not only going through transformations, but also resisting the maker. And, and is that that love that you developed for having your hands on the material and going through that process with it? Is that also part of this being in contact with nature, with time and with everything that the clay excavates, if you like? I think so, yes, of course, because when you have your hands on, as you say, you know, it's a complete communication mm. and the earth, well, the earth has in itself this whole history uh, that it carries through, you know, it's, um, it, it teaches us, it teaches us great things. Uh, this is 
Uh, you see on the screen Dionysos. It's one of my first sculptures. It's the first big one. It's about one meter high. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, well, I, what do I say about it? It, <laughs> <laughs> of course, uh, it's it's to, in my work. It's more the idea of. The, the person I'm trying to do that is paramount. It's yeah. not what I saw about it. I mean, it, I have not seen another Dionysos like this. <laughs> <laughs> um, this and you live with them, you know, you, you do live with them. The, what with the ideas of these people? With the ideas, yeah, yeah. with the ideas. Is that something that rings with you, Maggie? Living with the ideas. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Um, I spend a lot of time um, uh, thinking uh, now about my work, um, just uh, and perhaps doing actually less of it, but there's a lot more kind of uh, going through it and um, gathering it all together you know, at a kind of emotional and imaginative and perhaps thinking level before, you know, it go, I do anything on the page. Mm. Mm -hmm. So there's a living with it, yes. Do you, is that experience of sort of zooming out, but also looking backwards? I imagine it's kind of difficult and rewarding at the same time. You mean all this? Uh, Sort of looking back at the work um, over a long period of time and, and, and thinking about the connections that have run through it. Um, well, it's only an event like this that makes me, <laughs> gives me the chance to look back. I don't, I don't, I don't think about really what I've done. I right. just keep, I just keep with the cut with the present. But for instance, in preparing for this, I did look over my work and, I, it, I have see, I, I do realize there, there's lots of um, kind of similar energies and potencies there mm. and preoccupations, you know, but it's not something I, I spend much time dwelling on. I'm more interested in the moment and wh wh where I am now, you know. Yeah. Is that a viewpoint you, you sympathize with, Simone? Well, um, it's, I mean, I don't know. Uh, when I'm working, it's not that I am looking back or I'm talking about the past. I think it's a, it's it's the two universes gel in one image. Um, mm. I'm not. I don't want to 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 speak about the past, and I don't know it. I mean, do we know the past? No. Um, did we live it? No. It, we have fragments, little words here and there. Um, it's it's just um, it's a way of speaking today. I mean, to me, <laughs> it's uh, for this wounded warrior. Uh, it's I found for me the best way to show a wounded warrior. Now people see in it images that are very old, but how does it happen to be this way? I don't know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I, I guess one of the things I was thinking is that in both of your practices, there does seem um, to be a kind, maybe this is listening again, but a sense of listening to the past in the present. But, but you know, Simone, you, you quite explicitly evoke aspects of the ancient sometimes, yeah. you know, or long time. And, um, um, Maggie, you talked about the importance of the ancestral, increasing importance of the ancestral to you. Hmm. This one is like, is it Ishtar? I mean, uh, you know, it's... Uh, uh, also, when you are, I'm giving these names, I could call it young woman. Mm. All right? If I call it Ishtar, I think I also, it's, it's like the, like, uh, 
playwright. He, he will not use the name of any Mr. Smith around the corner. He's going to use a king and a queen because th these people will totally, uh, they want, they will be much easier to relate to, to an archetype than to our actual neighbor. The novel can speak about, you know, Little Dorrit or Mr. Bim, you know, whatever, yeah. <laughs> Oliver Twist. And, uh, but I don't think you can do that so much. It's not interesting in sculpture. Yeah. You know? But it's not conscious. Yeah. And, and sorry, Mag, Maggie, I very clumsily threw together loads of things there, but one yeah. was to invite you to think about, you, you mentioned the increasing importance of ancestry and, and, and I guess the folk is something that's run through from your father's song onwards. I look, uh, my, uh, my ancestors I feel are carried in my work um, and they carry me and they're um, profoundly uh, significant to me. Um, um, uh, I, I never knew any of my grandparents. Um, my parents came over here in the late 1940s. Um, uh, you know, one of the, the waves of um, uh, immigration uh, of the Irish, of which there have been many waves. Um, and um, I, uh, uh, I, um, they, uh, psychically, they are in my work um, and, um, uh, I, I feel very, very close to them, and um, particularly the the the, the sounds um, uh, and how um, in in Ireland um, uh, uh, there is a land a, a, re a remembering of language is connected with a remembering of land. It's completely one. There's no separation, and every place had a story or a song to live. And if it didn't have that, it, it would die. So there is a real important, there was a real importance of, 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 of like sing, singing a place into existence. And I think this, this, these energies are in my work and I'm grateful to my ancestors for that. And, 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 and they're, they're things that come through, you know, Simone says sort of unconsciously, mm. one, one, one makes connection to the past, yeah. Oh yes. Mm. Yeah. Um, there's a question, I don't mean to derail us here, but there's some questions that have come in from people in the audience. Um, I'm just going to compress a couple of them to start with, if that's all right. The, the, the first one is going back to what we were talking about in terms of the natural world. And this is a question asking about your reflections on the idea of the sentience of plants. Mm -hmm. um, if we can speak of such a thing, the question asks. Um, so something to do with mineral sentience and plant sentience and thinking about the fact that writers, just like sculptors, work with plant-based fibres, mm. papers, ink, etc. I guess. Um, and, and so whether you have any reflection on that, on the sort of not just animals, but plants and a, a broader natural world and its importance to how you think and feel and make. Are you asking me? Um, yeah, would you mind going first? Sorry, Maggie, please. The importance of plants' fibres. Um... I've never worked with fibers. Uh, um, I know some uh, uh, wonderful um, poet artists do plant fibers um, who actually make pages from plants, but I, I haven't. Um, but, uh, but plants have sentience, rivers have sentience, mountains have sentience, everything has sentience. Mm. It's just that um, at this moment, I still have to eat plants. Um, so hopefully there will be a time in the future when we won't have to kill them you know that's my concern yeah so I it's, it's, will it's... use them in the future in my somehow if they will allow me mm. so, so they're another element in that broad ecology that you feel very much part of yeah that, that, that's part of that every day you draw on yeah mm. thank you I, I don't know simone is that something you'd like to respond to it's a, it's a very broad prompt about the sentience of plants and, and possibly mineral sentience is proposed here? I think uh, you uh, you really, actually, it's like with you, you have to have a very long relationship to be able to communicate and hear what they are saying, what they are about. Um, and um, 
So I had a garden for 10 years when I was in California. Mm -hmm. And certainly I had um, knowledge of what they were about, what they were saying, what they were, uh, the language. Mm. Um, to me, for instance, when I was pruning a, a plant a, or a, a rose, suddenly it gives you a marvelous scent. And I was sure that it was a response to my oh. care, mm. to my working on it. Absolutely. And it, this, you know, this, it, it just surged. Of course, it's a, it's a, they are talking to us. And you learn so much, you learn so much. We, instead of going around the world, killing every animal we meet, every plant we meet, we, you should, as we already said, listen and get wiser. So, yes. <laughs> and I, the clay does that for you also. Yeah. The more I work with clay, the more I understand uh, what it's about. You can't do everything with clay. I already do a lot of, um, I, I, it, it's not very much, um, usually clay is made for bowls, for something that are, it, it's, it's earth after all, but I make it erect, I make it go up. And so I, it's a struggle, it's, a, you know, I, I, I <laughs> it's a dialogue. This, this sense of careful attention seems to run through everything we're talking about, be it publishing, be it listening to plant, be it gardening, be it anything else. That, that, relating to that, there's another audience question here that I'm going to break into two parts. It's come from Charles Bernstein and Charles, who I think you both know. And, and, and so Charles wants us to return to this question of the book, but connect it to architecture. So he's asking, He's wondering if either of you have reflections about how books relate to architecture as, as spaces, designed spaces, I guess. So that's the first part of the question. Uh, there's a second part of the question, which we can run into, I think, casually, which is then about that experience, the reader's experience of dwelling in that designed space of the book. So that spatial experience of the reader and the excavation of language you both scratched mm -hmm. out earlier. Um, Again, broad thing, I'm just asking for reflections rather than definitive answers, but but Maggie, could I turn to you first? About the book? Yeah, the book Able. and its relationship to design space and ideas of architecture, maybe to start with. Mm. Um, well, there are so many wonderful books. Uh, 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 Steve, uh, Steve uh, Clay's Granary Books does superb books uh, and artist books. Um, uh, I, I look at a lot of artists' books. I love looking at paintings. Um, but um, the book Spiritual Instrument, who said that? Was it Mallarmé? Or, um, but uh, that, that, that's how I, uh, I feel. But um, also the book is a wonderful place of uh, retrieval and undiminishment um, and uh, the opening, the invitation to a whole world, the physicality of it, and uh, uh, the object, the uh, the structure, an entity. Um, it, uh, it 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 takes it just it builds on the content and um, expands. It's a world. Those those experiential things, Maggie, are those things that you consciously think about when you're composing, when you're yes. writing. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Is that is that something that you you found yourself thinking more and more about as you've got further into your career, or has it always been something that again you're instinctively interested in? No, it it I think it's deepened. Yeah. Um, as I've got uh, older um, and working more. Um, and I think uh, the page and the book uh, for me are also great places of savagery and salvaging and undiminishment um, mm. and uh, absence and loss and silence. I feel it when I, I, I encounter it in a, in a, a work, you know. Mm. And, 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 and so that connects back to that, again, experientially, that's that excavation Mm. that reading experience is a kind of excavation of what's left behind on the page or something. Yes, yeah. yes. A kind mm. of retrieval of, of 
of hidden of uh, mm. hidden hiddennesses. Um, Simone, can I invite you if, if if there are reflections you want to share on that? It was it was about this connection possibly between books and design space, maybe oh, I architecture. I wonder if there's something that goes back to rugs and carpets as well. Mm. But also this excavation of language, this readerly experience. No, you see, uh, carpets are works of art. Mm. Something you see in one look. You look at a okay. work of art or a carpet and you receive the whole information. The book- As image. You have, it's like a cathedral. It's more like architecture because you, it's a, you have to go through page after page. Mm. It's something you, 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 you walk into, you go into. And so it's not at all, uh, it should not be a work of art. It should be something you read. You never should forget that because a lot of artists' books becomes objects. And it's another kind mm. of books. Mm. <laughs> but the book, to me, mm. has to be read. Mm. And uh, the art has to be way used in it to make it readable. It's, so it's in it service of that readability. Take, it should not take the place of the reading. That's mm. why, for instance, I never used color inside my books. Uh, because when they, a book has color, that's it. Nobody reads the text. And some people who do artist books, they go too far away from uh, the reader, from mm. the, the purpose of the book. I mean, it's my philosophy, of course. Yeah. Another thing, I mean, there is a bookstore in Berlin, which is absolutely superb. It, it you have books the design of them is just fantastic and i like to, i buy some although i don't i cannot read them in <laughs> but uh, this is also another thing with the design i don't know how they do it it's just fantastic i'm sure some people can read them but this is to me the most it's architecture is closer to books than art I mean, then what we think okay. painting or sculpture. Well. So it's so it's, it's it's interesting for me what you say there about only using black ink on the main body because yeah. because I'm thinking about a book that you published like Etel's uh, The Arab Apocalypse, mm -hmm. which has these almost hieroglyphic drawing like components mm -hmm. as part of the text. That's but as you say, it works in line. But most importantly, her book Journey to Mount Tamalpais, which was. Yeah written on her practice as a painter, yeah. and she wanted her, her drawings and paintings to be in it. We did the whole thing black and white. And it mm. is, has been just republished in the US by Litmus Press. And I asked her not to use color inside the book because it's a text. It's mm. not a, a book about painting. It's not an art book. It has to be read. And if you start putting color, yeah. And drawings is, is wonderful. Drawings is really writing. Writing yeah. is drawing. <laughs> okay, why not? Is that, well, is that a connection between Mark making that you feel, Maggie, as well, this drawing as writing? Because it's something that seems quite present in your more recent works. Drawing as writing, right? Yeah, as and the drawing, entwinement yes. of the two. Mm. And I disagree with Simone. I think the colour in a text is uh, uh, is, yeah. a, is another aspect of the making. Um, it makes me more excited. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it it uh, it kind of invites more more dimensions, uh, more questionings because I, I use a lot of uh, uh, color in my texts. Um, and it's a part, of, I feel it's part of the language, part of the language. Mm. Yeah. Uh, th there's, a, there's another question that's come in here, um, which I'm gonna paraphrase to squash down, but, but it's someone just asking you both to reflect on the role of waiting and patience mm. in your working methods. Um, and whether that's an important quality of how you work, a kind of, yeah, they talk about expectancy as well as patience. 
a kind of part of the quietness and listening. So I wonder, Simone, is that something you would mind reflecting on first? Uh, patience and expectancy are absolutely part of the clay work because, mm. uh, you know, you when you make a piece, you have to wait for it to dry. So it's a, it, you have to wait for the right moment, not too dry, not to, and as I said, the process of, of firing twice and so on. So it's a long process. It's mm. uh, it's a long reflective process to me. Yeah. Is it, I'm wondering about the next phase of composition for you, Simone, when, when the work is finished and you're thinking about an exhibition, to what extent do you get involved in thinking about the choreography of that and, and what should partner what, if you like? Is that an important, is exhibition making an important part for you? I never think of the exhibition oh. when I'm working and uh, um, I cannot also beforehand know exactly how I'm going to show uh, the work. Uh, because I have to see the place, I have to see the... Uh, it's not something I can think about beforehand. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to the color because... Yeah, my, please, sorry. I understand what she said, because in your case, the color must be part of the text. Mm. This is different. Yes. Yeah, I'm talking about illustration. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. What I mean. Mm. Now, of course, if you are writing, you can write a word in, English, in red or blue or mm. make a drawing. Mm. But this, when the text is normal, let's say, mm. you know, mm. then you add the color, then it's mm. something else. But if mm. it's inherent to the text, of course, it's mm. wonderful. Mm. Hello. <laughs> Maggie, could I ask you, um, would you mind reflecting on, on the role of patience and expectancy or waiting in, in, in your working method? Absolutely crucial, mm. completely fundamental. Uh, my work uh, takes as long as, as it, takes, it takes the time it needs. It yeah. has nothing to do with me and I wouldn't want to impose any kind of stress or pressure on it. Um, in a way, um, I'm kind of holding a space um, and uh, uh, just I spend a lot of time waiting. I never rush anything. Um, and I'm such I'm a very by sort of at normal standards, a very slow worker. But that that is. Um, you know, as against people who, who write a lot, but or you know, I'm I'm really slow, and but that that is how that is the form, and that is the time scale, yeah. um, and the spatial realities that the work needs. Yeah. I'm just waiting there, tending, tending. You really feel like a conduit for the work, like Absolutely. it's coming through you. Yes. Mm. Yeah. And I spend a lot of time in solitude. The work needs demands solitude yeah. uh, uh, in my life. Um, so, so that's necessary as well. Yeah. Like uh, previous to what Simone said about he hearing, mm -hmm. you know, if we slowed down, um, we would hear so much more about, you know, the plants and the roses in the garden, everything, every, every creature in the garden, everything around us. Simone, um, bridging from that, can I ask you about your, your making tempo? Do, do you set out with a plan for what you're going to do with every lump of clay or, or are you really finding the work in the process? Usually I find the work in the process yeah. and it is, you know, it, it, it follows the stream of consciousness that you have, you know, while you are kneading and preparing the, the, the clay, sometimes you, you have it, it's immediately, it, it forms itself, oh, you say, well, that's good. <laughs> It's very important to, to, to look because sometimes you say, well, I just started, it's impossible. It's, it can't just be already, but um, this stream of consciousness will bring a, 
a line of poetry or a person or a fact or something and then I, I work I build on it I, I work and I, I very much follow what I'm thinking about mm -hmm. I mean both together yes mm -hmm. and, and there and, and there's not preparatory drawings or or anything it's... Not, no not at all mm -hmm. no. the drawings are very different the mm -hmm. watercolors I do the color are very different from mm -hmm. uh, my sculpture. Um, Maggie, when you're writing, is it a constant process of redrafting the work or do you separately make notes and then develop this kind of manuscript version? Uh, thing, uh, things come to me, pieces or things I hear. Um, I used to work on the wall, but um, I don't at the minute, uh, but I'll go back to that. So they're all spread out on the wall, uh, mm. texts, and they have their own kind of energies and attractions and needs, and they find they find uh, one another uh, uh, um, physically, visually, or sonically. Yeah. Um, going back to what to what, to, I just want to say that um, vigilance is also uh, something. I'm. Uh, I'm vigilant uh, every, every waking moment, I hope. I'm vigilant. I have to be for my work. Um, just, it's partly to do with that waiting, uh, look, hearing that some sound might be just what's needed or um, what the work needs at that point or uh, some kind of texture or some color or, uh, or something needs to come out, you know. And this is in every day that is, you know. Cool. I, I'm, I'm really interested in, in, in what you described to us, this wall and this, mm. and this, these, it sounds like kind of fragments mm. almost arranged and, and then you're looking for these gravitational pulls between mm. them. But, mm. but that sounds like such a spatial practice. It is a spatial practice, yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And you need that space. To I work on the wall, yes. Yeah. Um, but I haven't, well, it's a long story, but I had a flood in my house. So I, you know, the room where I used to um, uh, work, uh, I've taken my stuff down, but I do work on the wall, yes. I don't mm. work. Um, mm. It's a and special was, practice. Was that, was that an instinctive thing you began to do quite early on? Or? No. Uh, about the last 10 years. Okay. Mm. I think it might, it's sort of roughly to do when I stopped doing the large assemblages, but I still wanted, I worked on the wall, but with the language. Um, yeah, okay. Yes. So there was the vacuum left by stopping doing those material things and- Well, I'm not, maybe, I'm not sure. Okay. I hate pinning it down because then it seems like I know, uh, you know, it's sort of a bit like that, yes. Yeah. Mm. But um, there are pieces, and fragments is a, a kind of difficult, a difficult term because they're mm. not, they're like shards. They're pieces, but they all have this energy that brings, the, that brings them together. Mm. It's not like it's just odd bits and pieces. Mm. I feel their en the energy that brings them together. Um, it's not just higgledy piggledy. Yeah. Um, and again, yeah. it's about listening to the a lot, of, a lot of waiting and a lot of vigilance and a lot yeah. of listening goes into making the work. Yeah. Mm. Uh, hopefully, humility. I hope too. Yeah. Mm. Simone, you mentioned that collaging is often the first thing you do, <laughs> and and so again, there's this sort of sense of arranging shards or feeling the pull of bits. That's true. Yes. Yeah. They start also sometimes with one image that talks to you, you want to, yeah, and then you try to to give it to, to to give it a space, to give it other things that go with it. My collages are actually to be read. I I, I keep the image to whole. I don't cut it in pieces like other people who do collage you finish with an abstract painting. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's it's more like a Persian miniature where you read every image with a lot of uh, time. 
mm. because uh, you want to see this image and that image. Uh, it's not the the whole, of course, makes also uh, something, but uh, it's also in the detail of it. Yeah, and then not abstract. <laughs> Contrary to my work, which is really abstracting the idea. Um, there are millions of topics, and I, I, I've got an excited list of questions, but I, I don't want to dominate the conversation. So is, is there anything either of you feel like we stepped over too quickly? Maggie, go. <laughs> well, I just want, as this is, a, as, as, coming back to the question of sculpture i just want to mention joseph boys who has been ah. a huge influence um on my practice um uh and the uh you know the um fluidity and malleability of material you know he used felt and fat and honey um uh, and um you know this huge openness um yeah, and what, I guess there's also like a very overt and quite radical ecological uh, impulse in the work as well. Absolutely, is that... yes. So, it, so is it the form of the work that you found attractive or is it the sensibility of the artist that you, you found influential? The questions that he asked okay. in the work. So yeah. conceptually? Yes. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Are, are there other key figures for you, Maggie, in, a, in terms of influences. I'm particularly interested in sculptural influences, but not exclusively. Uh, well, Eva Hess, um, Doris Salcedo, Louise Bourgeois. What, what is it about Eva Hess's work in particular? Uh, well, again, again, it's the, it's the fragility, using um, completely fragile materials and pushing them to their limits um, and taking um, uh, uh, the way she worked across painting and sculpture, um, mm. which I've, you know, I've tried to do that from, from uh, uh, I love this, this, uh, trans this, this traversing across, across uh, manifestations. Mm. And the vulnerability, um, I think vulnerability is something very important to me in the work of art, of, of, in any work. Mm. This letting go of the ego and just bring, letting this work come, letting, this, letting the materials and the work come through. Um, th th there's a question that's come in here. I I'm gonna have to make this the last one I ask. So anyone who's sent in a question that I haven't had time to get to, I I'm really sorry, but, but this last one I want to throw in is, is quite straightforward. The, the, the person's asking how important the physical body, I guess your body, is as a stimulus for the practices you have. Like how, yeah, if, if that makes sense. Simone, is that something I could ask you to start with? Yes, it all comes from the body. I mean, uh, the body is needing, the body is thinking, the body is transmitting, it's giving. I mean, um, it's always there. We are not spirit and body, we are one. <laughs> mm. I guess one thing that's quite interesting in, in my experience of your, your, your work, Simone, is that the quite, inter the quite curious scale of the sculptures, and uh, which I'm sure is part determined by kilns and things like that, like technical things, but, but, but they're always this, not diminutive, but sort of two thirds size or something like that. You know, this, this feeling that it's not, that it's smaller than me, my body as viewer. And I wonder how intentional or important that is as well, the viewer's body. Well, I started doing, for example, the Dionysos, which I saw, I did it on my own. And I don't think I could have built higher mm. along. Now, when I worked with a ceramist, Hans Spinner, I asked him the first question, how big is your kiln? And because he helped me build, I was able to do one meter 50. Mm. You know? And it's very hard to go higher in one piece. Of course, you can do many pieces and put them together and go higher. But that was also something that I was not interested in. So the height is something that actually what you can get away with. 
the small, the small is beautiful also. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm sorry, and I'm really pushing it now time-wise, but Maggie, scale, this question of scale, an epic topic I'm going to open up at the end. But 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 in in a sense, you, you your work often has quite minimal yes. uh, quantities on the page. Mm. Um, is there anything about scale that I could probe you to to say? Uh, well, I think small small um, is very very potent, um, uh, and that's what I love about Simone's work. Um, so very, very uh, poetic and suggestive. Um, mm. um, and uh, just coming back to the body, the body is absolutely completely my work, um, mm. my body, you know, um, uh, everything is, is it, you couldn't make the work without my body. I'm absolutely glad that it's in the work mm. and it is the work. And that's part of the vulnerability no as well. For me. Yeah. No. Mm. And that's part of the vulnerability as well. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Um, that's a, a really beautiful place to end. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've already pushed my luck with the timer. <laughs> but I want to thank you both dearly for joining me tonight. Maggie O'Sullivan and Simone Fatale. It's been a real pleasure. I want to thank Claire and her colleagues at the Henry Moore Institute for facilitating everything. Um, thank Lara Eagleton and her colleagues at Corridor 8 as our media partner for supporting all of these events and the whole programme. Thanks so much for joining us and big thanks again thank to you. Simone and Maggie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Simone.